Well, it has been several weeks since I have uh, done any filming. I have been working on the airplane, no sweat on that. I um, had a couple side projects, I had to paint the house, I had to do some work on my car. I bought some tools, I learned some new skills. One of the tools I got was a tubing bender. Uh, this is just a piece of 3 16 scrap. 3 16 is the same diameter as those GAP26 uh, pedal probe tubes. And then I also need to learn how to flare them. And this is a bad example on this particular piece of scrap here. Um, this is a good one. So the fittings that I got with my EFIS installation kit call for a uh, flared fitting, the standard aerospace 37 degrees, so I bought that tool. And then um, this is, I believe, an AN3 fitting, and then it goes into NPT, which is kind of the opposite of what goes into the wings. Uh, speaking of the wings, I had to get some sealant. Had the uh, beginnings of supply chain issues for me, the old part number, the 9AR, whatever it's called, I'll put the part number up here someplace, uh, is unobtainium. I don't know if they stopped making it or whatever. I found a couple of suppliers online. Uh, never got a product out of them, but when all else fails, call Kid Fox, right? So I got a hold of uh, Heather. She was able to sell me the material that they use now, which is a Permatex, Permatex 85420. I'll put up a better picture. And of course, I was supposed to get the Yak-18 from uh, California, and that trip turned out to be a bust. I did go down, saw the airplane, met the owner, um, all very cool, great airplane, but the annual inspection wasn't complete, engine hadn't been run, some missing paperwork, and the owner has some health issues, so basically we'll back that truck up until potentially next spring uh, when the weather improves. But anyway, I thought I had an episode pretty much uh, buttoned up, decided to cut out quite a bit of it, get back into the details of uh, showing more progress on the airplane instead of me running my trap. So anyway, Wing tanks, number two, ribs, leading edge, flaperons, and as I say, that and more in episode 18. Uh, one of the things I'm going to admit up front is that I, I got hung up on the rib number two, and I'll show all that video here in a minute, but basically it's one of those places where it seemed like a difficult task to me to get those shims in there underneath that piece of floppy cap strip. And I went down a rabbit trail where I created a check tool, which probably took me eight to 12 hours to make. And the process became very complicated in my head. So I started looking on people's build videos and on threads, and I couldn't see where anybody made more than a passing mention that they'd done their number two rib. So as it turns out, I was just thinking too hard. And when I finally figured it out and also got access to the table saw and chop saw, I was able to make some shims and it took me about one hour per wing. And probably can't see it from here, but then I went around each of those wood blocks with high saw um, just to seal the wood in place and help out with the bonding. I did attempt to be tricky on the hose that goes from the top of the header tank. It's a vent line, which goes up to the right tank only. It's a eighth inch NPT and I'm planning on using dash 4 an hose and fittings and so I this is an example of why you should not just order parts while you're sitting on the couch but actually go out and look at your airplane so I got this that I thought was gonna work it's um, it is 8th inch NPT into dash 4 an and it's just a simple elbow plenty compact the problem is that the flange on the gas tank should have known this um, is close enough that you can't spin this around so Fortunately, an inexpensive mistake. One of the things I threw in my cart while I was ordering that was a straight 8th inch NPT to dash 4 AN. And then I had these uh, elbows with a swivel, which is a female dash 4 AN into male AN4. And that should take care of my problem. So I'll know in a couple days that's already shipped. So I had started working on the aluminum strips which go out at the wingtip end. You rivet and bond them eventually to the underside of the cap strips on rib number 10, fit the wingtips on. And when I started laying those out yesterday, I was gonna get rid of drill holes and I realized that it was time to make the decision as to whether I'm doing the Laker leading edge or going with the standard PVC. Winner is a uh, liquor leading edge. So this, I have the long pieces of PVC in my hanger. Talked about that a few times. This is the piece which would, which would be shipped to you with the liquor leading edge kit. 
You cut this into, I think if I got this right, inch and a half pieces. They go on ribs number one, three, five, seven, and 10. I'm not gonna spend any time filming it. Again, I'll point to Brian Bowen's video. It's episode number nine. I know that because I was watching it this morning. Uh, however, it did occur to me that I had not seen any instructions for the leaker leading edge. So I emailed Heather this morning within minutes. She had sent me a PDF copy of the insulation instructions. Pictures are in color. Awesome, Heather's a rock star. I uh, appreciate that help. Oh, next up, false ribs. So I hate false ribs a lot, uh, just because they're tedious. Kind of like the look of them, like the way they fill out the wing. So the only ones that are left are the ones that go, uh, they attach to the bottom of the fuel tank and they fill up the gap. Uh, I've seen them cut down. This is uh, my first attempt right here. There's not much left after you cut one of these ribs down. Anyway, so I have four of them marked up. I'm actually not going to do uh, the three in each bay. I'm going to do one in each bay and call it good. Like I said, don't love these false ribs. I've already kind of put them in place. Looks fine. Aerodynamically, it'll be fine. The fabric can't go very far. So I'm at the fuel tank bonding stage, and I decided to work a little bit ahead and varnish my number two ribs before I tried to install them, because certainly... On the uh, upper side of these cap strips, you can't see anything. I uh, don't have access to them to uh, put any varnish on. So anyway, I put on a nice uh, coat the other day before I left on a trip and sanded it back down. I was ready to put on a second coat and I decided to see if I was going to have to remove any wood. I don't know if I filmed it the other day. I probably did not, but the first thing I discovered when I set these things on here was that I had to remove quite a bit of wood in here to get them to match up as far as the length went, to get the tails of the ribs and to make sure that these were all lined up. So at least you're removing wood. And so I thought I was about ready to go, but here I am about ready to uh, put a second coat of varnish on here. And I put a wing tank in. And you can see that uh, this edge is gonna require quite a bit of trimming. So what I'm gonna do here in just a few minutes is uh, clamp one of my long scales across here so that it mates up with the edge of the tank. Pull the tank, I think about how I'm gonna do that, put this rib back on and draw this line and cut this rib off before I start uh, doing any more varnish. Anyway, so I'm gonna strike that line, cut this, put a second coat on, uh, and then these tanks, which I sloshed again to get rid of any of the uh, fiberglass dust inside from tapping the holes deeper. And then, oh, also because I trimmed this edge a little bit more, so I needed to leak test, finally got it right. Uh, these tanks make sure they're good to go so uh, here it is trimmed like I said I put tape right at the top edge of the tank pulled the tank out clamped that scale across here put this rib in place located it with the uh, piece of trailing edge uh, material marked it cut it and a little bit of high saw and that'll be good to go it matches up real nice here so well now I have my left wing number two rib trimmed fit in place that just took a few minutes and now I'm laying out my strategy for bonding the tank in place so the plan now is bonding these tanks in place obviously I'll pull off the trailing edge and number two rib but I got back here to see how big my contact patch is going to be and on the forward edge it's pretty significant I'm about to mark this off with my sharpie pen but on the rear tank you can see there is quite a gap in here so if I had sealant or excuse me adhesive all over the this edge of the tank, it's probably not going to even contact. So it looks like, I really, really can't get a good angle on it, but from about the 90 degree tangent point around the corner is going to be sufficient. But any sealant which goes around here is going to be a big waste of time. That gap is uh, almost three eighths of an inch uh, until it wraps around the corner. So that's a smaller surface contact in the back. I have my adhesive that's called out in the manual. I'm about to whittle the end off and put this in my caulking gun. Uh, the manual has you do a wavy pattern that's three eighths of an inch wide so that'll all be approximate and then you button the tank in the front edge drop the rear edge down it says clamp it lightly in place i've had these tanks in and out of here a dozen times it's not going to take much clamping uh, to get that done i should say um, what i did was used uh, 220 paper per the manual on this bonding surface and on here on the rear one again you can see that's basically the bonding surface that we're going to get uh, cleaned everything up with denatured alcohol, red scotch Brite pad, and a denatured alcohol to clean up all this. And real quick like, because I don't have much time. 
There's a left wing tank is in position. I haven't clamped it. It's going to need just the bare minimum of, of clamping to hold it in place. And here's this one all gooped up. Tank sitting right here. I'm going to set this down. Now that I have the fuel tanks bonded in place, trailing edge number two rib, at least the tail part of it in place, that leaves this floppy piece of cap strip. The manual has you using some individually sized wooden spacers to uh, hold up the cap strip relative to the bottom of the fuel tank. And then you just run a straight edge from ribs number one and three uh, to pick up that edge. And the issue I'm having is that my table saw and chop saw are both about 150 miles away. I could have used those to accurately saw some spacers that would have worked in here and as it is I'm trying to cut these down by hand not having a lot of luck with that. So the manual doesn't provide you a whole lot of guidance on how big to make the spacers, what to make them out of, or their positions so that kind of leaves it up to the builder. It's po quite possible that on the newer kits they actually provide the shim material uh, but in this case you know picking up somebody else's project they don't have that luxury. So you have to run a straight edge between ribs number one and three in order to uh, pick the height of this shim. So you have to be able to dodge around these uh, low points in the tank because they stick down below the cap strip on the rib. And this is where your fuel strainer goes. And this is the low point in the fuel where the outlet goes to your header tank. So you need to pick positions for these three shims at least, which allow you to work around this. So the first one I did was just past the tangent point on here and the size of the shims I picked was a little bit narrower than the width and roughly an inch long. And for the rest of these, it pays to understand that it's not a flat bottom airfoil. The low spot is in here somewhere and there's a high spot up here. So it pays to put one of the shims up here and in this case, dodging around this, the lowest point is pretty close to this one right here. And so what I did to make these shims was use the fence on my table saw and make some cuts and then I would just bump the fence over slightly, just a few thou, run it back through and that gave me both the small and large uh, shim by splitting down the middle of the piece of molding. And then I left the pieces about this long and it enabled me to come over here and slide these in here and see if there was one that was just just kind of like a feeler gauge, you're looking for one that fits. So that one could fit right here. So based on the fact that I had my positions, I would just run these under here until I found a piece that would work. And again, based on the slight variations in the way the tanks fit, uh, just because the shim fits here in this location doesn't mean it would fit in the same location on the other tank. And in fact, it did not. The shims on the other tank are all uh, slightly thicker than the ones I used here. Anyway, so I just had this random pile. This is just a few of them. I probably had a dozen or more. And once I found a shim that would work in a given location, I cut its uh, width down and then prepped the surface. So I have a picture where I had a bunch of masking tape on here that you'll see where I was able to sand the varnish off the, what would be the upper side of the cap strip and also to sand the location on the tank without getting anything else all scratched up. Then I pulled that tape mixed up the uh, high saw and bonded everything in place and then I used uh, tape to hold everything in place until it cured and then it's when I came back with more high saw and worked it around each of these to seal those in and uh, finish the job. So now a little bit of acetone will be able to clean off all these marks and mission accomplished. So really the last two major projects before I could start covering besides pulling a little bit of wire no big deal is the Laker leading edge, that decision had to be made, and the flap rods, which you have to hang on the wings with the uh, hinge attach points, and then you pull them off after you've drilled all the holes, and then you can cover. So one of the other skills I had to learn was 
uh, riveting. So I'm using solid rivets on this. And speaking of the rivets, what I did was use some of my extra scrap metal. These are some of the door frames that came off my airplane and drilled a random hole pattern. And then the very first thing I did is I used the 95001 rivets, which are 3 seconds by 1 8 inch aluminum. Look at the tub up there, sorry. Uh, and this is what it looks like on the other end. And so that's what the manual has you do. It's fine. But I know a lot of the builders that go to these um, solid rivets where you have to squeeze them. And so I decided to take a shot at doing that. Uh, do not take advice from me because this is the sum total of solid rivets that I've ever squeezed my entire life. So there's experts out there, but basically, basically using this rivet squeezer, which is on loan to me by fellow Kid Fox builder Eric. Uh, what I did is I found two pieces of metal, which which was the same thickness as the trailing edge of the flapper on, and drilled all the holes, deburred them all. Started with this one right here, and then decided to practice squeezing. And I'll probably have to throw some better pictures on here, but I started out squeezing them way too much, and it's because I had the wrong jaws in here. Went over, sought some assistance from my uncle. We swapped out one of these jaws right here, and he squeezed, I think this one right here. And then I got to practice, and the other thing I did uh, was I had been using the 330 seconds drill, which is 0 .0935 inches, and I stepped up to number 40, which is, I think, what the entire industry uses anyway, and uh, it was much easier to slip them through. And the results are these last three measure um, exactly one and a half rivet diameters and the height is one half of the rivet diameter. And I would say these are within a few thou in either direction from there. So I'm uh, pretty happy with my huge amount of experience. And that puts me on the trail to squeeze these, which is what I'm going to do right now. So early this summer, I was under the gun to get the covering on my airplane because the adhesive uh, goes bad quickly. And the date on my adhesive said uh, August 28th. So I, that's why I put a whole lot of effort into get my wings ready to cover. So here it is, the end of October, and I still haven't used any adhesive. However, there is uh, online instruction and there's stuff in the manual. So like a lot of products which have a date on them, the date's a little bit conservative. Maybe it's good, maybe it's not. As it turns out, there are ways to evaluate the adhesive. Uh, one of them is a visual inspection. If the stuff is curdled at all, it's bad. It's probably been frozen. If it is just a little bit watery and you can agitate it slightly and it uh, mixes up well, still good to go. The stuff I have is beautiful. I have some old stuff that came with my project from 2016. It does have the curdled look and it's also a little bit yellow. Neither of those are good qualities. And then also in the manual, thanks to somebody on the forum, they pointed out a page in the manual which has a mechanical, basically it's a peel test, uh, where you can verify the strength of the adhesive you have. And so I'm going to be doing that real soon. But uh, so far, it looks like I'm uh, still okay on my adhesive. So that's all good news. So after coming out here the other night, doing all this riveting, giving myself a high five because all these rivets came out beautifully and I did not screw up the flapper on. I dropped a note to Brandon to ask about using Hysol on this one, which is one that I have that's disbonded, about 20, 24 inches, somewhere in there. And I asked if I could just use Hysol. I was sure that's what they used to make it, and then rivet it. And the response I got wasn't the one I was hoping for, which is that with that much disbonding, I should probably just get new flapper ons. Brandon said they did use Hysol at one point, and I indicated that I thought this was a clear adhesive of some kind, and that kind of creeped him out because he doesn't recollect that they ever used anything like that. I can see now that I've peeled this back a little bit more that it probably is high salt that's in there, but let's move on. Uh, so nowadays they use a urethane adhesive, which causes no problems, no cracking, everybody's happy. I believe you probably still do the riveting like this. So before I bit the bullet and decided I was gonna buy new flapperons, I 
I did a little bit of engineering to see how many rivets I'd have to put in there. The answer is a lot, about every, less than one inch apart. And then you also have to think, well, what if I did four inches or two inches? What's the worst thing that could happen? And the answer to that is a catastrophic failure of a f critical flight control service. I'm not going to play that game. I don't intend to die on an airplane, uh, especially with one that I built myself. So what I did was uh, I did a place order for Flaperons through Heather. She said uh, generically four to six week lead time. Uh, supply chain issues right now, trying to get the aluminum tube for the spars. I may see them early next year. So a couple months. And what I'm going to do when they are ready is not pay for shipping is I'm going to take this crate, which was used for wing spars and has been what stored my flaperons for this past over a year. And I will take this to Idaho. I will pack the flaperons in the crate myself and either roof rack them or put them on a trailer and drive home. So even though finding out I was going to have to buy new flaperons didn't really make me super happy. They are a critical flight, not one of those places I'm going to cut any corners. The costs aren't super uh, freak show, especially if I don't do the shipping, I just go get them. So it'll be cool to see the factory and the uh, people that work there. And of course, uh, getting to see Idaho is uh, always a bonus. So thanks for watching, thanks for tuning in, and uh, hopefully it won't be too long before I get all this stuff done, and you'll see the next episode. I'll see you next time.